As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner, and this is the Medical Treatment Center in the Asclepion, which is located in the bottom part of ancient Pergamum. The Asclepion was a massive medical complex that attracted sick people from all over the Roman world. But when they came here, they didn't just come for medical help, they came for supernatural help. This was called the Asclepion because it was dedicated to the goddess Clepios, who was the Greek god of healing. And when people came here to be healed, one important part of the process was sleeping. And at night, of course, they had dreams. The people slept in this particular facility. This is one room where the sick slept. But there are all kinds of rooms here, and these rooms were filled with people. And during the night, when they went to sleep, they would have dreams. The next morning when they woke up, the priests of Asclepios would interview them to find out what they dreamed. And on the basis of their dreams, then they would begin to prescribe what kind of supernatural power was required to heal them. But there was something else very important that happened here. The serpent or the snake was the symbol of the god Asclepios. And during the night, while the sick were sleeping, the priests would come into this facility, this very facility, and they would release sacred snakes to slither all over the place during the night. And they believed if one of those snakes happened to slither across your body, if it actually touched you, that was the sign that the god Asclepios was touching you in a supernatural way. So when the sick were sleeping, they were also hoping that those snakes would slither across their bodies. This was a very, very evil, evil, dark religion. The early church had to know how to deal with evil. They had to know how to resist evil. We don't deal with that particular kind of evil today, but we deal with other forms of evil. Things that are unjust, things that are not right, morals that are being pushed upon us, which do not agree with the teaching of the Bible. We need to know how to resist evil in our personal lives and in our families. And today I want to talk to you about resisting evil. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. We saw in the open that the early church had to deal with all kinds of really dark, evil forces. They had no choice. Their world was filled with spiritual darkness, a hostile government and unbelievers that were against them. They had to learn how to deal with evil and how to resist evil forces. And they did it and they did it successfully. And I guarantee you, if they could do it, you can do it too. Now today, we have different forms of evil. We have philosophies that are trying to affect the way that we think and what we believe. We see society is trying to change ethics and morals. People are really throwing away what they once believed and are beginning to believe new things that are not appropriate and fitting with the teachings of the scripture. There's all kinds of evil. In fact, in the previous programs, we've seen that we need to learn how to resist temptation. That's one thing we need to resist. We saw that we need to be able to resist a bad environment. Everybody has to deal with bad environments from time to time. Then we saw that we have to be able to resist faithless opinions. Uh, yeah, 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 that's a difficult one. We need to be able to resist the voice of the devil himself. We need to be able to resist all of these things. And the good news is you can do it. And today I'm going to summarize our teaching. It's going to be very helpful. But first, I want to remind you about what we're offering you this month. Now, I have a lot of books. I encourage you to go to the website, look at the books that we have to offer you that I've written. I'm writing books all the time. For example, right now I'm writing three books that are really going to help you and take you to a new place in your relationship with God. I believe that. But I've got a whole stack of books on the subject of resisting evil. It'd be good for you to order Dress to Kill, but that's not what we're offering right now. Right now we're offering this CD series called Resisting the Enemy. Resisting the Enemy. How do you resist the enemy? How do you build a barricade so he can't get into your life? Or if he's already gotten into your life, how do you push him back across the line? What does the Bible say about resisting 
the enemy. And I want to read you from the back of the series. It says, believers definitely have more power and authority than the devil does. Amen. That's the truth. So why does the enemy still seem to win battles in so many Christians' lives? In this CD series, I explain that the kingdom of darkness has what some Christians have ignored. Well, what does the kingdom of darkness have? Commitment, organization, and discipline. In other words, the devil is really serious about victimizing your life. The devil is committed, he's organized, he's disciplined, he's very serious about victimizing you or your kids or your grandchildren children or your business or anybody. The devil is very serious about hurting people. You have to recognize that your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against unseen spiritual forces that are working in the background. You have to refuse to give up and reinforce your victory over Satan in the spirit by resisting his attack steadfastly in faith. And then you can watch as natural circumstances change and you come out on the other side in victory. Wow. All of that is in this series. You know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This would be good for you to hear and hear and hear, to play it and replay it until finally you really understand what's required to successfully resist the enemy. Order it today. I believe it'll make a big difference in your life. But today I want to review what we've already covered. We're talking about resisting evil. So we've covered four primary points and today I want to wrap it up. I want to cover them one more time to make sure you really got them. What kinds of evil are we supposed to resist? And first of all, we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that we are to resist temptation. Just summarizing, reviewing, really want to make sure you got it. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. We saw that phrase, common to man, the Greek word anthropinos, which means it's just normal, nothing special. It's just a regular human temptation. And that's important because when you're being tempted, very often you think, oh, this is so difficult. It's such a mountain for me to climb. Oh, this that I'm feeling, it's so intense. You know what? Don't magnify it. It's just common to man. You're not facing anything that anybody else has not already faced and overcome, and you can overcome it too. How you look at your trial and your temptation is very important. If you magnify it, you'll make it worse. If you diminish it, it will be easier for you to have authority over it. And this verse says, no temptation has taken you, but such as is anthropinus. It's just ordinary. It's just common to man, nothing special about it. And then it continues to say, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Now, God did not send the problem, but God is so good. He'll make a way for you to get out. And here's the way. He will, with the temptation, make a way for you to escape. And we saw that that word escape is a Greek word, ek basis, from the word ek, which means out, the word basis, which means to walk. You put the two words together, it simply means use your feet and walk out of there. Just walk out of there. And I gave the example of a man who came to me for counseling decades ago. He was falling into a sexual sin with his girlfriend. And he said, oh, I'm just struggling with this temptation. And I said to him, where are you when this temptation takes place? Well, I'm at my girlfriend's apartment. I said, have you ever thought maybe you shouldn't be there? Maybe you ought to move your feet and walk out. He said, what? Leave in the middle of the temptation? I need to stay there and prove how strong I am. I said, brother, you're obviously not strong because you keep falling into sin. Maybe it's time for you to use your head. God's making a way for you to escape. And the way to escape is in your shoes. It's called feet. Move your feet. Get up and get out of there. And that's why the following verse in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14 says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, isn't that something? In verse 13, he says, God will make a way for you to escape. The Greek word ekbasis, God will make a way for you to walk out of the situation and the following verse, he says, flee from idolatry. Places of idolatry were places of fornication. So now Paul says to his readers, if you're in a tough place where you're being tempted, use your feet to walk out of that situation. Then the next verse, he says, in fact, don't just walk, run. 
This Greek word flee means move your feet as fast as you can move them. So number one, the way to overcome temptation, to resist temptation, is use your feet. If you're in a situation where you're being tempted, walk out. If you're in an environment with friends and they're saying negative things that affect you negatively, use your feet, walk out. You don't have to stay there. You can get out just like you walked in. So number one, resist temptation by using your feet. Number two, we are to resist a bad environment. Bad environments are really hard to handle. And the Bible refers to this in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. We've already seen this, but I want to cover it again. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Sin which does so easily beset us. That word beset is the Greek word euperistatos. The word you describes something that's comfortable, something that even feels good. The word you. The word peri is a Greek word which describes something that's all around you. You're surrounded by it on every side. The word status describes something that's standing. When you compound the three words together, it's you, peri, status. It's something that surrounds you. It's an environment standing all around you where you have come to feel comfortable. But it's a bad environment. You're comfortable there because it's your old set of friends. They've always been your friends. They are your friends. It's who you always talk to. But the fact is now they're beginning to weigh you down. Or maybe you're in an environment where people are drinking and you've been delivered from drinking. But that's where your friends go, so that's where you're going to be with your friends. And you find yourself in an environment where you used to feel very comfortable. You're surrounded by it, standing all around you. But now that environment is having such a negative effect on your life. The Bible says you need to lay it aside, get rid of it, choose a new set of friends, choose a new environment. You might be in a bad church. Well, I hate to say it, but some churches really are not too positive. They take you down because of unbelief. And very often it's hard to leave those churches because of tradition. You've been there a long time. You love those people. And in fact, you even know that those people love you. And the reason you keep hanging out there is because you keep hoping that those people will change, but they're not changing. And in fact, you're the one that's changing. You find yourself becoming more cynical, faithless. You know what? You may have been comfortable in that environment at one time, but it's no longer good for you. It's stopping you in your race of faith. It's holding you down. And according to Hebrews 12, verse 1, if you're in any environment that's holding you down, taking you down, then you need to get out of that euperistatos. You need to move out of that environment that once was comfortable to you, but now has become a detriment. Get out of it. Lay it aside. The scripture teaches this so clearly. Then we saw number three, we need to resist faithless opinions. And this is found in Hebrews chapter 10. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 and verse 33, it says, Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. And here the Bible is teaching us that when we've been illuminated concerning something, very often it throws us into a fight with bad opinions of people who don't agree with what we've been illuminated about. I remember when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, oh, I was so excited. And I went to a meeting and in that meeting I was prayed for and I was healed. I had a very serious kidney condition. It was a big thing for me to go to that meeting because I was from a denominational background and for me to step out of my traditional church and go to a charismatic meeting was a very big deal. And there I was, found myself in a prayer line with a very serious kidney condition. The minister in that meeting laid hands on me and I fell under the power of God. Didn't even know what that was. I'd never heard of that. So I wasn't imitating or fabricating an experience. It just happened. I fell under the power of God. And when I was laying on the floor, I felt the power of God radiating through my body up and down, up and down, up and down. When I stood up, I was healed of that kidney condition and I have never had a problem with it since. But when I stood up, 
I looked straight in front of me and standing in the choir loft were two members of my denominational church who had come to kind of spy out what was happening in the meeting. Well, at that time I was a teenager. Before I got home that night, my parents had already received a phone call from those two people from our church informing them that I had been to a Pentecostal charismatic meeting where I had fallen under the power and I had some kind of a Pentecostal experience which was contrary to our denominational teaching. And when I came home, I, 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 I came home to opinions and not just the opinions of my family. Even my pastor called me in for a counseling meeting to try to convince me what I had experienced was not authentic, that it was just emotional or something bizarre they tried to talk me into releasing it. I had to deal with bad opinions. And this verse says that when you've been illuminated, get ready because you will become a gazing stock. The word gazing stock, as we saw, is the Greek word for a theater. It means when you receive a word from God or when you receive a directive or when you have a new experience with the Lord, very often it puts you on the stage. Before you get a word from God, nobody talks about you. Before you have a new supernatural encounter, nobody ever talks about you. But the moment you say, God spoke to me, or the moment you say, I've had a new experience, suddenly you're on the stage and everybody's watching you. You leave the public life and now you become public property. Everybody's talking about you. Did he really experience something from God or was this something bizarre? Did he really hear from God or is he hallucinating? Everybody buys a ticket to the show and they come to watch. And the writer of Hebrews, not trying to scare us, but trying to prepare us, says this is just the way it works. It's just human nature. To be honest, you've probably done this to somebody. Maybe you've heard somebody else say they're going to do something. And you've thought, mm-hmm, well, they've never done anything yet. Well, let's watch and see. You see, that's what happens when you make a declaration or a confession, people buy a ticket to the show. And the writer of Hebrews says, you need to know this is the way it is. And rather than become a victim to bad opinions, faithless opinions, you need to surround yourself with people of faith, people who will support you. Listen to people that have already done something. Don't listen to people that haven't done anything. They don't know how to do anything. You need to listen to people that have already done the impossible. Those are the people who have something to say to you. So make sure, rather than listen to faithless opinions, that you listen to the right voices. Then we saw that we need to resist the devil's voice, the devil himself. And we looked at John chapter 10, verse 10, an amazing, familiar verse but when you understand John 10.10, 10, as it's written in the Greek, it really changes it. And in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We saw that this word thief is a Greek word, kleptes. The word kleptes is where we get the word for a kleptomaniac. No one knew the devil better than Jesus. Jesus knew the devil when he was still Lucifer. And from the very beginning of time, Jesus knew the devil always was a kleptomaniac. He always wanted what did not belong to him. The devil wanted God's position. Why? Because he's a kleptomaniac. He just wants. He wants to take. He wanted the glory that was going to God. He wanted to take it. He even wanted the geographical location of God. The Bible tells us he wanted the sides of the north. That's where the throne of God was. The devil just wanted to take, 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 take. That's because he's a thief. He's a kleptomaniac. And when we first find the devil operating the Bible, it is in the garden, in the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden. And what's he doing? He's doing the same thing. He's trying to take Adam's position, take Adam's authority. He wants to take the garden. Why? Because his nature is twisted. It's bent. He's flawed. He's a thief. Jesus says that. And Jesus says the thief or the kleptomaniac comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The word steal is a Greek word, klepto. It's the active form of the word kleptes. You could translate it, when the kleptomaniac shows up, he'll start acting like a kleptomaniac. He'll try to clean you out, take you to the cleaners, 
leave you insolvent, flat broke. He'll try to take everything you've got, put his hands in your pocket, wiggle his way into your personal affairs. He is a pickpocket. He is a bandit. He is a kleptomaniac. And Jesus says, not only does he come to steal, but he comes to kill. And we saw this word kill. What a powerful word. The word thuo. And the word thuo is really the word for a religious sacrifice. And here's what you've got to be so careful about. This is why you have to know the voice of the devil. The devil will try to speak to you religiously. This word kill, the word thuo, describes a religious sacrifice. And when the devil's cleaned you out, if he discovers that he's left you with anything... He might even try to disguise his voice to sound like the voice of God. He'll say, you know what? There's no hope of recovery. Things are so destroyed. Everything has been lost. That little bit that remains, why don't you just lay it on the altar? Surrender it. Make a sacrifice. Give it up. He wants you to give up everything good in your life. You have to recognize the devil's voice, and resist it. You have to resist it. And then today, I want us to conclude with one final verse on this subject, and that is in the book of James. And in James chapter 4, verse 7, a powerful verse about resisting the devil. In James 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, in this series, we've been talking about resisting the devil. The word resist really describes a pre-planned, orderly resistance. In other words, this is a person so serious about resisting the devil, he's put a lot of thought into this issue of how to resist. But the first part of the verse is very important. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. If you just try to resist the devil by yourself, he will beat you black and blue. If you want to have authority over the devil, first of all, you have to submit yourself to God. Make sure that your spiritual life is in order. If there's anything you need to repent of, repent of it. Submit yourself to God. Submit to God's authority. Submit to God's word. Make sure everything's right between you and God. Everything is clean. Everything is in order. Submit yourself to God. By the way, the word submit is a military word, which means to fall in line. Find yourself ordered under the authority of God. And when you're in that position, then you can resist. You can put up a fine resistance. And James 4 verse 7 says, the devil will flee from you. That word flee is that same Greek word, which means to move your feet as fast as you can move them. The devil won't just inch away from you. He will flee. He'll move his feet as fast as he can. He will literally rush away from you in terror when you resist him. Now, if you don't resist him, he'll push you all over the place. He'll push you around as long as you're willing to be pushed around. He'll push you around in your health. He'll push you around in your marriage. He'll push you around in your emotions, pushing you, pushing you, just manipulating, twisting you, turning you all the time. He'll do that as long as you'll let him do that. But the moment you submit yourself to God and say, that's enough, and you begin to resist him, the devil doesn't know how to deal with that. And rather than you being pushed around, you begin pushing him around. And you push him right out of your life. You can resist evil in your life. I'll be back in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. Do you feel you're in a fight for your life? Is the enemy attacking your mind with depression, fear, or temptation? As a Christian, you don't have to accept it. You can overcome and resist the enemy. In our spiritual battle, the fight is not entirely against flesh and blood, but also against unseen spiritual forces. Regardless of what you are facing, Christ has already given you the power and authority to defeat the enemy every day. In the two-part CD series, Resisting the Enemy, Rick explains how you can defeat the attacks that the kingdom of darkness tries to wage against your mind. With God-given weapons and the knowledge of how to use them, you can win the battle for your mind. When you call or go online in order resisting the enemy, you'll learn how the devil continuously bombards your mind in order to dominate your life. But you can overcome by learning how to enforce our victory over Satan. 
by submitting to God and resisting the enemy. When you choose to believe God and commit to His Word by resisting the lies of the devil, you can and will see your circumstances change. When you call or go online today, you'll also receive the companion book, Spiritual Weapons to Defeat the Enemy. This book gives you a fresh understanding of the armor of God, the spiritual weapons of war, and how you can defeat every lie of the devil and live in victory every day. Don't miss this special offer, Resisting the Enemy and the companion book, Spiritual Weapons to Defeat the Enemy. Call now or go to renner.org to order. I remember once when our ministry came under financial attack. Have you ever been under financial attack? That's horrible. When it seems like your money dries up or you don't have enough money to pay your bills. And this thing went on and on and on. I was binding it. I felt like I was bailing water, like we were sinking. I'm telling you, we were in the middle of a real financial storm. And this thing just continued and continued for so long. And finally, one day, the Spirit of God in me just rose up and said, Enough. That is enough. It's time for you, Rick Renner, to draw the line and push the devil back across that line. And in about five seconds, I did what I hadn't been able to do for a long period of time. Faith rose up in me. A voice of authority was released through me. I rebuked the devil and literally drove that thief back across the line, drove it out of my life, out of my ministry. And guess what? The financial attack stopped. I had to resist that evil. It wasn't going to stop by itself. I had to say, I'm not going to permit you to operate here anymore. And it really was out of that series, out of that experience, that this series was born called Resisting the Enemy. This is a great series. It'll help you. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I really believe that as you hear this, you're going to be equipped to know how to rise up in your own situation and to push the devil back across the line in your own life. So I want you to go to our website or call our number and order it today. This could be the key to your deliverance. I believe that. But I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for this precious moment that we could share today in the truths of God's Word. I thank you, Father, that we can resist temptation. We can resist a bad environment. We can resist bad influences, the voice of the devil. We can submit ourselves to you and find ourselves in a position of power. And I pray this for my friend today in Jesus' name. Thank you for being with me. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in you. And I'll see you in the next program. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.